All right, welcome back to another episode of the Cody Tucker Show. As always, I'm your host, Cody Tucker. Be sure to like and subscribe. All that good stuff. Tell a friend. Um, boy, I don't know if it's coming across through the old, uh, <laughs> through the microphone and uh, uh, camera, but I have come down with a uh, a bit of an illness. <laughs> I think it's just allergies, so you know, fingers crossed. Hopefully, all those years of not wearing a uh, condom haven't, you know, done something uh, irreversible. But we'll see. So far, no lesions uh, that I'm aware of. Granted, can't exactly get a uh, a good look down there uh, for obvious reasons. Probably going to have to buy a uh, selfie stick <laughs> and try to, you know, get through the old... Uh, underbrush do a little uh, investigating but uh as of right now i actually don't feel like terrible terrible i think i just sound a lot worse than i feel which i probably shouldn't have even recorded an episode today but um there's no telling how long this is gonna last it seems to happen every year uh you know texas is a is an interesting place and i know lots of places uh, you know, the weather changes pretty randomly. Not like here. It is, I mean, to have like 50 degree drops and dips and highs and lows, whatever, like three times a week can't be good for you. Exhibit A. But, you know, I'm going to muscle through it <laughs> and then I'm going to drink so much cough syrup like I'm gonna it's like I'm gonna feel like I'm gonna feel like I'm back in (laughs) H-Town oh man let me uh keezy oh boy um so you know uh thoughts and prayers would be uh much appreciated (laughs) yeah um, I mean, unless you're one of whoever it is that's praying that I get sick, then you stop, uh, you stop your prayers. I mean, hell, I'll probably just make a GoFundMe and just see what that does. Hell, if, uh, a billionaire can do it, then so can I. <laughs> All right. So let's just go ahead and do a little dive into, uh, what's going on in the world. So, mm, first thing god that felt so good like i mean i know cigarettes aren't helping which is why i haven't been smoking cigarettes lately um but the i really don't know where this train of thought was going my guess probably nowhere as are most of my trains of thought it's a good thing I record myself talking once a week. <laughs> All right. No, so this popped into my old, uh, uh, you know, news feed. And, you know, around this time of year, for me, you know, excluding, holy fuck, I'm dying. Um, excluding uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, you know, that end of the year. This really is, uh, like, one of my favorite times of year. Mostly Super Bowl. Still cold as hell, usually. Which I, as a big fat fuck, thoroughly enjoy. But also because uh, you really start seeing how stupid the people who are in charge of things really are. And what I mean by this is this is when we get to Oscar season, which I already did a little talk about that, about, you know, just how much of a sham the Oscars are. The Academy Awards are a complete fucking joke. Uh, but that was, you know, a couple weeks ago, but also one that I kind of forgot about the annual rock and roll hall of fame induction. 
Now, the list of nominees has been released, and oh my god. So here, so yeah, Ozzy Osbourne, Sharon Oasis lead 2024 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominees. Now, I don't think these are the people who are actually getting inducted for sure. I don't think that's happened yet. You have to vote, which I did vote, um, you know, put in my two cents. Uh, now, I just want to go over the list the people who were nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for 2024. And let's let's just go ahead and see, uh, you know, did they get it? Now that, so if you don't know, Jan, the, holy fuck. Um, do, boop, 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 boop. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is ran by, or used to be run by, Rolling Stone Magazine, basically, by a fellow named Jan Winter. AKA one of the most pretentious, arrogant douchebags probably to ever walk the earth. Uh, basically would veto people who were getting voted in and say, eh, I don't really like their music. Uh, here, uh, here at Rolling Stone magazine, we're not supporters of their music. They're not getting inducted. We're going to instead induct fucking uh, Madonna. And that's how it was for a long time. Now, granted, a lot of people who were inducted deserved it. I would say probably the majority. But every year, it seems like... And I don't think Jan Winter does it anymore because he turned out to be... Uh, well, what I've been, you know, screaming from the rooftops for fucking years. He turned out to be a bit of a, uh, a jackass. And I'm pretty sure he stepped down from his post as, you know the uh, Fuhrer of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, with that being said, I was kind of hopeful that, okay, finally, some of the people who, for whatever reason, have been getting snubbed every year, will finally make it into the Hall of Fame. And I know that most people are probably saying, why the fuck would you even care about this? And you're probably right. I probably shouldn't care about any of this. But I do. I don't know why. I do. I like rock and roll history. I love the... The folklore of it, uh, you know, the tracing back of like inspirations to find out, like to get to like point zero, um, you know, like that was like always a fun thing for me to do as a kid, because as I've mentioned, and I know this is going to be super hard for most people to believe, I did not have a, uh, a ton of friends growing up. <laughs> I was not a very sociable person. Um. So definitely spent a lot of time alone, a lot of time to myself, either watching movies, reading, listening to music, playing guitar, basically like cramming my brain with information that I found interesting, which usually had to do with either film history, weird serial killer shit, or rock and roll history. So I consider myself to be... Expert is not, no, like what is below an expert? A maven? Isn't a maven like a person who knows a lot about something, but isn't like expert level? Whatever. I have a a very deep knowledge of rock and roll and a love of rock and roll music. And I take my opinions on rock and roll very like, I have very strong opinions when it comes to music. Um... I don't like kind of like anything. Everything is either this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life or I would rather listen to my grandparents have sex than listen to this song again. That's kind of my like it's a hotter hotter cold. There is no lukewarm um cool like it it is love hate. That's how all of my opinions are really. Um but specifically when it comes to music. So, the one focal point for, like, for observing and paying homage or homage, whichever one it's supposed to be. Is it homage or homage? Homage sounds right, but I think it's probably homage. Homage. We'll say homage because I think that, you know, off the tip of my wiener, that sounds right. Um, paying homage to, you know people who I 
have looked up to my entire life and have been a fan of my entire life and music, you know, not to sound all, you know, uh, fruity here, but music changes lives has definitely changed my life. Uh, safe to say, I probably would not be, uh, may not even be here if it wasn't for like certain music. So whenever I see that Sinead O'Connor is nominated (laughs) to be put into the basically the shrine of rock music. Yeah, I get a little grumpy. Um, (laughs) For whatever reason, I guess now we're just going to start putting in one hit wonders into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So if if that little fella Sinead O'Connor gets put in next year, I better see fucking Right Said Fred, uh, Dexy's Midnight Runners, and... uh, Get damn Rico Suave put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Hell, put in the who's the Macarena fellas? Los, not La, uh, Los, uh, shit. Los Del Rio. Put in Los Del Rio into that damn thing. If you're putting in Sinead O'Connor, a person who had one hit song, and it wasn't even her song. It's a song written by Prince. Who now, granted, Sinead O'Connor would blow away any karaoke uh, spot (laughs) on earth because that's basically what Sinead O'Connor made a career as is being a person with an insanely good voice just saying other people's songs a la Elvis Presley but Elvis is the king so he's got going I mean you know whatever Elvis had a, a fuck ton of hit songs now granted yeah were they written by him not a one but you know I digress. Hell, actually, if you go back and look at like music from the 50s, none of those motherfuckers wrote those songs. Chuck Berry, Little Rich, well, Little Richard wrote a handful of his songs. I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis, like a lot of the people did not write their own songs. Actually, a little rock and roll history, just because why not? And to kind of like maybe stymie the, uh, ooh, is stymie? Is that the word? Why does that sound racist? Hmm. It does, but I don't think it is. Oh boy. Um, so for the whole argument of like people stealing each other's music and making money off of, you know, whatever, not giving people credit, I'm just kind of like set the record straight on that. Um, everyone did it. Now the artists themselves had very little control over any of that information. So what would happen is back in the day, which may still be this way now, I don't know. I don't pay any fucking attention to, you know, anything that came out after 9-11. Um, 9-11 changed everything. All right. So there used to be, again, still may be, I don't know, but there definitely used to be on the billboard charts. You would have like the country Western charts and the R and B charts. This is actually even before there was like the rock and roll charts. Now, what would happen is there'd be like record labels would have a team of songwriters working in their labels. Now, for whatever reason, maybe just coincidence, who knows? These groups of people used to be like middle-aged Jewish white dudes. Don't know why, just how it was. Um, there was like, I think one was called like the wrecking crew. I mean, there was like a t- every like chess records had one Atlantic had one EMI, like all these record labels had their like group of songwriters who would just churn out hits, probably couldn't fucking play an instrument to save their lives or sing to save their lives, but they could write songs. They knew how songwriting worked and they could just dish out hundreds of songs. So, you know, the record labels would discover like a young musician, say a country Western musician in Alabama, R and B musician in uh, fucking Indianapolis. Uh, they would take one of the songs, country Western song, give it to the country Western artist. It would do very well, climb up the charts. Instead of having to write a second song for the R&B artist, they'd say, actually, we're just going to give you the same song and you're going to do an R&B cover of that song and vice versa. So you could get double the record sales with half the songs. 
you're giving eat your so that's why you if you look back in like early 50s maybe like late 40s early 50s even into like the mid 50s it's like the same songs on both charts it would just be like Hank Williams doing one and then you know, like Billy Holiday doing one and I mean I'm not saying that's like the exact example cuz who the fuck knows but that's how it worked and then rock and roll comes along they make a rock and roll chart and now you're doing it three different ways so Elvis recording Hound Dog is not Elvis stealing that song from uh, old Big Mama Thornton. She did not write that song. That song was written by, again, a group of middle-aged Jewish white dudes. They had her record that song for their record label, then gave the song to Elvis. Elvis records it. Elvis does not owe her any money. It wasn't her song to begin with. She was just the first person to record it. The people who get the money for that are the people who write the songs. That's why like writing songwriting credits are such a big deal and why a lot of bands break up over that. Is and you know, you have one person in the band making triple the money because his name is on all the songs. Now there are some bands who like I think the Doors did it where no matter what, every song was credited to all four people. So, in theory, they're all four making the exact same amount of money. Now, so like, yeah, Elvis doesn't owe her any money. And same, like in every different combination of that, none of those people owe the other person money. The person who gets the money is the person who writes the song. If she wrote the song and Elvis did it and they didn't give her the money, way different. And that does happen. I'm not saying that that has never happened because Led Zeppelin, boy, as much of a Led Zeppelin fan as I am, they are notorious for ripping off like old black blues musicians from the like 30s and 40s. So, yeah, like basically taking the exact same song, changing like the chorus and the title and saying, oh, no, that's no, a different song. No, it isn't. So I'm not talking about that. That is ridiculous and shouldn't be happening. And those people should, they're, well, their estates, because those people are all dead, should be suing Led Zeppelin and whatever other bands that are doing that. So there's how I got to this point. I am in no way sure. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about this right now. My God. Well, anyways, hopefully it just maybe like, Maybe that's interesting to some people. I don't fucking know. Um, but that's just how it worked. That is how the record... And hell, it pro it might still work like that. I don't know. Uh, but it definitely worked like that all the way up through like the 40s, 50s, even into like the 60s when all three charts were separated. Country, Western, R&B, Rock. Um, yeah, you, I mean, if you can get th three times the money, why wouldn't you do that? So yeah, like why would you write a separate song for Elvis when you could also have Elvis record it? Fucking, I don't know. I mean, I have a hard time. Like the fucking Statler brothers record it and then have, you know, uh, Aretha Franklin record it. Like why would you do a different song? Fuck no, just give them all the same song. Anyways. So, back to the original point. Again, no clue how we got to this point. I definitely fell asleep at the wheel <laughs> about 15 minutes ago. Um, Sinead O'Connor does not deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And here are, some of the, here are the nominees. And we'll just go through them. And, I mean, this is astounding to me. Mariah Carey. How? How is Mariah Carey in any way a rock and roll artist? And and to make a further point, if there was just a music hall of fame, 100% Mariah Carey should have been in a long time ago. Mariah Carey, if I'm not mistaken, this record's probably been broken, but for a long time, had more number one singles than any other female artist ever. I think Rihanna broke that record, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. Music Hall of Fame, Mariah Carey, without a doubt, you know, fucking first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, no. Uh, 
it's just, it's not the same thing. Fucking like just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean that you should be like credited in all the other sections. Like Scottie Pippen is one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He shouldn't be in the NFL Hall of Fame in play football. <laughs> now, Bo Jackson should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame and the Football Hall of Fame. Deion Sanders should be in both. There are people who, like, there's a Country Western Hall of Fame. Johnny Cash should be in both, Country Western and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. His music blends. Is there? I don't know if there's a rap hall, like a hip-hop Hall of Fame. I'm sure there is. But, like, Public Enemy 100% should be in both. NWA should be in both. And I think R. I mean, I know they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Run DMC should be in both. Beastie Boys should be in both. Their music kind of like blurs the lines. Like Public Enemy is way more of a rock band than fucking Cat Stevens. Granted, I still think Cat Stevens should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Mariah Carey isn't in that group. (laughs) So Mariah Carey, Oasis, which is basically just... 90 uh, grunge Beatles. I mean, the most whiniest and granted, I get, you know, Oasis is a rock band, but I fucking hate that band so much. Um, uh, Sinead O'Connor already talked about it. Lenny Kravitz, hundred percent should be in the rock and roll of fame. So there's one tribe called quest. No, no tribe called quest music is not rock adjacent. Mary J. Blige. No, Mary, but Mary J. Blige shouldn't be in any hall of fame. Mary J. Bosch had like, what, two songs that are like, no. Ozzy Osbourne, yes. Foreigner, fucking, how has Foreigner not been in the Rock and Roll of Fame already? Cher, no. No way. You might as well put Olivia Newton-John in the Rock and Roll of Fame. Peter Frampton, yes. I, I'm not a Peter Frampton fan, but Frampton Comes Alive is, I think, like one of the top ten highest selling albums of all time. And then Dave Matthews Band. I mean, it's basically flannel fish or, uh, you know, fucking, uh, like it's alternative Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> That's basically what the Dave Matthews band. I not a fan of the Dave Matthews band whatsoever. Um, like, no, 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 no. Uh, but People love the Dave Matthews Band. And it is a rock band. So, you know what? They should be in it. Now, I also decided to make a little list of just some of the bands. Some of the bands who are eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, yet have never been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Alice in Chains. Bad Company. Boston. Iron Maiden. Jethro Tull, Motorhead, Blue Oyster Cult, The Guess Who, NXS, Scorpions, Sticks, Super Tramp, Pantera, Grand Funk Railroad. That is not even like a tenth of the massive bands who are not in the Rock and Roll of Fame. If Sinead O'Connor goes into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before Bad Company or Iron Maiden, I'm going to go to Cleveland and Kaczynski, that goddamn building. Uh, not really, but, you know. Like, there is... I don't get it. And... It, it just makes no sense to me. And this is how the Rock and Roll Hall of, Hall of Shame has always been. I mean, it is... This is not new. Um, I mean, they wouldn't put Kiss in for a long time. Black Sabbath, I think, was eligible for like 16 years before they got put in. Uh, Rush was another one that was eligible for fucking like 15 years maybe before they got put in. And then you have, you know, fucking uh, Barbara Streisand getting in and back in the 90s or whatever, which I don't think she is, but still. Um, fucking Madonna got put into the Rock and Roll of Fame like way before Kiss or Rush did. How is that? A th- how does that happen? Um, now again, music hall of fame. Yes. Like I, I just, I don't get that. And granted, this all goes back to me hoping that someday I'll become the dictator of America. And when I do, 
I will be in charge of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And granted, I th- I would think that I'd be a little bit more fair than old Yon Winter, but actually I probably won't. Like I'm not putting in fucking. I'm taking Aerosmith right back out, taking the Eagles right back out. <laughs> yeah, Hall of Fame revoked. Um, no, no. I mean, it, you should be in the Hall of Fame if you are a rock and roll band or artist uh, or rock and roll adjacent, like you know, kind of fluid between the you know that and another genre like Johnny Cash, Public Enemy, um, and have had a massive impact on music. And if there's a band that's been around longer or, you know, like it shouldn't necessarily just be like whoever's oldest gets put in. I don't know. It it could be done so much better. It's fucking stupid. I mean, it makes no sense to me that this is a thing. And it's also crazy. I've been talking about this shit for like 25 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. Sinead O'Connor's probably going to go in. And, you know, I mean, she's fucking dead, so it's not like she's going to know that it happened. But who knows? They'll probably. I mean, just it's crazy. Because they always have the person who's inducted, or they try to have them come up and perform, like, some of their songs. Like, what other songs would Sinead O'Connor perform other than Nothing Compares to You? Like, she doesn't have, a like, a set list. <laughs> so even if she was alive, she'd just have to come up there and play that one. And then at the end go, oh, any request? Uh, oh, nothing compares to you again? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> like, I, there are other one-hit wonders that are way better. Like, our you know, Minute Work is definitely not a one But, like, Minute Work should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Before Sinead O'Connor, for sure. Falco. I mean, Rock Me Amadeus is a way better song. Uh, you know, what's his name? Schilling. Uh, Major Tom coming up, whatever that guy's name is. They put him in there. You know how crazy it is to make a sequel to a song that you didn't write? Like, you made a sequel to Space Oddity from David Bowie. The balls it takes to be like, I'm going to take one of the most legendary songs of all time and make a sequel to it. And it actually works. Like, that song is amazing. I almost said his name was Kurt Schilling. I don't think there's... <laughs> I don't think that it's Kurt Schilling, the former pitcher for the... Was it Red Sox? Tom Schilling? Whatever. It's something Schilling. Peter Schilling. Peter Schilling. Um, anyways, whatever. So there's, you know, my thoughts on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um... I mean, do yourself a favor and just look up, like, just Google, you know, bands ele- bands not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or people not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and just look at that list. It is, I mean, it is incredible. And then you see people who have been nominated, like, multiple times and haven't gotten in and now are just not getting nominated again. Well, why were they worthy of being nominated six years ago and not now? Like, there's, there's a handful in there. I think, like, Blue Oyster Cult was nominated, like, maybe a couple years ago. And now they're not on the list. Which, granted, I'm not, like, a massive fan of them, but whatever. A very legendary band. Like, how is that? How does that happen? Like, who just became eligible who's now more worthy? Fucking like Oasis? That band sucks. I, I mean, one, I just hate whiny music. And to me, they're, they are, like, 90s. Ed Sheeran. There's no hardly any of a difference. But, you know, wanted to be John Lennon and Paul McCartney so bad. And they're n- the fucking not. Um, Wonderwall, I... Like, I will run full speed, head down, fucking head first into a brick wall if that song comes on. It, it like it, just to make myself unconscious, risk death to not hear. Today is gonna be ugh, fucking horrible. 
That band sucks. And then Dave Matthews Band. How in the fuck does that happen? You mean to tell me that, like, what band comes to mind when you think of rock and roll? First, Boston. Like, what song comes to mind first when you think of, a, like, a fucking massive rock and roll show? More than a feeling? Or, I don't know, or whatever Dave Matthews songs are. There's no Dave Matthews band song that, you know, out rocks anything off of Boston's first album. Anything off a of bad company, like Feel Like Making Love, Shooting Star, like those songs. How in the hell does Crash Into Me out rock those songs? Fucking. Not to mention Dave Matthews likes getting shit on by prostitutes, which, you know, allegedly, I guess, but whatever. It just, it's. It just doesn't make any sense. Put fucking Criss Cross in the Hall of Fame and call it a day. Holy shit. All right. So, we'll just stop from there because, again, this is just, this has gone on too long. So, I do want to, you know, I've been watching a lot of movies lately, so I do kind of want to go through, like, some of the movies I watch. Let me just give my recommendations, whether you should watch, shouldn't watch. Um... This is going to be a movie review of movies that have been out for a long time, which I don't know how much of, the, of a market there is in that for that, <laughs> but I guess I'm going to find out. So, um, uh, introducing a somewhat new segment, or kind of a segment that I just haven't done in a long time, but we'll call it somewhat new, of um, what did I watch this week? Eh. Here we go. All right, so for the next segment, um, introducing a new one, kind of, I think, figured out what <laughs> what I'm going to do with it. Uh, I'm going to take a couple movies that I watched this week and tell you whether you should stream them or skip them. New segment called Stream or Skip. There we go. That sounds kind of like a thing. Um so first one, movie to stream. Oppenheimer. I finally watched this movie. Only took about, uh, I don't know, half a year. But I finally sat down and watched it. Now, I will say, out of all the movies to stream, if you have a pretty lengthy list of movies that you want to watch, put this at the bottom. It is a movie you should watch. But don't, uh, you know... Don't feel obligated to do it as soon as possible. Because I, as much as I did, I did enjoy this movie. It was not uh, anywhere near as good as I thought it was going to be. Now, the acting is very good. Directing is obviously incredible. Christopher Nolan is a fucking genius. Um, it, there's a lot of, the movie should not have been as long as it was. For one, which I think is the, kind of the consensus of most people. And I don't mind long movies. I love long movies. If they're supposed to be long. This movie should have either been a... Mi Actually, I never would normally say this. But this movie should have been like a... I don't know, six-part miniseries. Would have been much better. But instead, it's a exactly three-hour movie that feels like 12 hours. Like, I... I was like, I had to take a piss so bad. And normally when I start a movie, I do not want to stop it for any reason. Uh, I hate watching like half a movie and then finishing the other half later. I hate that so much. So I was like, all right, I got three hours to kill. I'm watching this movie. And yeah, a little bit or a while in, I was like, all right, well, the movie's got to be close to being over. But I had to piss so bad. So I paused it to go piss, go piss. And whenever I come back down, I looked and I had 45 minutes left. <laughs> I was like, there is no way that that could be true. And boy, it was, it, it had 45 minutes left. And I was like, this is the most drawn out movie I've ever seen. Now I know it sounds like I'm just shitting on this movie, which I kind of am, but you still should watch it. It is 
Like the amount of amazing actors who are in this movie. Killian Murphy, Matt Damon, Casey Affleck, uh, Jason Clark, Florence Pugh. Um, did I say Robert Downey Jr.? Yeah, Robert Downey Jr. is amazing in this movie. The best actor in the movie is Robert Downey Jr., which I know, like, obviously Killian Murphy's the star, but, like, Robert Downey Jr. is so good in this movie. Uh, who else? The guy that played Han Solo in the uh, Solo movie. Uh, fucking Josh Peck is in it. There's a lot of people in it where you're like, holy shit, this, like, how many fucking people are in this movie? David Crumholtz, uh, fucking... Was it not Jason Schwartzman? Yeah, I think Jason Schwartzman's in it. I mean, there's so many people in this movie. Um, I mean, uh, fucking Tony Goldwyn. It just keeps going on and on. Like every time that they film a, scene, a new scene, you're like, geez, Rami Malik. Like every, <laughs> it just keeps going. Like every single time that they like introduce somebody new, you're like, oh, I know who that person is. Fucking Brad Dennis Quaid's kid is in this movie. Um, so yeah, acting. I mean, the probably the greatest like cast of actors to ever be put. I mean, as far as like the biggest, just the most like recognizable faces. I don't think there's a movie that comes close. Uh, maybe like JFK, which actually there's a lot of similarities between this and JFK. Um, except JFK doesn't feel like it's 15 hours long. Um, now. I mean, you just have to, you still have to see it because it is, it is a very good movie. And I normally would never suggest to like watch a movie in parts, but probably break this one up into hour chunks. If you watch this movie is three hour long parts, I should have done that. Like I would never do that for a movie, but I should have done that for this movie. I think I would have given it like a, a fucking 10 out of 10, which it should be because it is it is incredible. Like the movie is amazing. I mean, the sound, the, it is now the sex. I mean, now I, I know there was a big, big topic of discussion. The sex scene is weird as shit. And I kind of forgot that it was even part of it. And that that was kind of like a thing until I was watching. It and I was like, Oh God, I've never been more like turned off in my life. Like it had the like sexual charisma of a of a like a of a birth video <laughs> like that's more of a turn on I mean it was so weird like really weird Florence Pugh is pretty attractive so it's crazy I mean as great of a director as Christopher Nolan is for him to make like a very attractive actress seem like like get rid of any kind of like sexuality I mean that that's a that's a feat for sure anyways what stream it it's on it's on uh, peacock stream it it's it is worth it but break it up into hour-long chunks it's better that way all right so that's the stream now time for a I think probably one of the biggest letdowns I've ever like a movie that I was so excited for and then so just heartbroken. This is a big skip right here. The killer. So I am a massive fan. David Fincher to me is the greatest director of all time. I mean, obviously like Steven Spielberg is, you know, is Spielberg. But take away Steven Spielberg. David Fincher is my favorite director. Like, like if I think of like what aesthetic of a movie that I like the most. It's how David Fincher films movies, the cinematography, everything in a Fincher movie, fucking whether it's seven fight club, Zodiac, uh, social network, girl, with the drink tattoo panic room. I love David Fincher's movies and a writer who I am a massive fan of Andrew Kevin Walker, who wrote, um, seven he did like i think some of the writing on fight club he wrote eight millimeter which i know you know they kind of fucking butchered but andrew andrew kevin walker is a fucking incredible writer so for them to be teaming up again shit, first time since seven like full on team up boys i say and i mean i know that people say you know 
some not great things about Michael Fassbender. Michael Fassbender is an amazing actor. So all of these things combined, like this movie is going to be, and it's about, it's about a hitman. Like how could this movie not be incredible? Well, if you make a movie be the most boring goddamn movie ever made, that'll do it. If you just have nothing happen, nothing happens in this movie. Like it feels like things are happening. It feels like you should be like on the edge of your seat, but for some reason you're not. And you think, well, how could that be? How could it be that like the music makes me think that something exciting is happening. Michael Fassbender seems like a little worried about something. Uh, It's kind of seems like there's like a chase going on. How could it be that I am bored out of my mind right now? That's what happened. I don't get it. I don't get how that is possible. But David Fincher was able to do the unthinkable and take a, basically take like an award-winning recipe for, say like a beef Wellington. Like beef Wellington seems like a very difficult thing to make. It seems like you have to know what you're doing to make it. But if anyone could, you know, if anyone could make the movie version of that, David Fincher, and then somehow, instead of filling it with, you know, whatever the fucking meat is in a beef Wellington, instead he filled it with literal dog shit and said, I don't know where I went wrong. That's kind of how this movie feels. It is like, it is... That wasn't a fart, by the way. If it, that, I don't know if that picked up on the microphone. I shouldn't have said anything, just in case. I've it was just such a letdown. Like I was. Now I'll say the ending very good has a very good ending. The problem with a movie having a great ending is that it doesn't happen until um, the fucking end of the movie. <laughs> so yeah, you know, a great last ten minutes. But what about the first two hours and fucking 20 minutes? This is also, I think, it was felt like a very long movie. For all I know, this movie could have been 35 minutes. It felt like six hours. It has, you know, in that way, kind of similar to Oppenheimer. But I would not break this movie up into parts. If, for whatever reason, you just have to watch this movie, muscle through it and just get it over with and be done with it. You're going to hate it. You're going to be so bummed that you even watched it. But... I mean, if you just have, if you're like me and have been looking forward to this movie and just have to watch it, go ahead. But God, I mean, it it is amazing that you could have all of these good pieces and just make such a hunk of shit. But all right, all right. So that's it. There's the stream. There's the skip. Uh, do with that information what you will. Hopefully it helps you uh, figure out what you want to watch. Definitely watch Oppenheimer again to reiterate, watch Oppenheimer. It is a good movie. You're going to feel bored and feel like, Oh boy, this is a very long three hours. Three hours is a long time. So, you know, maybe think about cutting it up into chunks. I think it would be better that way. And the killer just pretend like that movie never happened. Pretend like it was in development and then just got, for whatever reason, never came out. That would do your, that would do, it would do yourself a lot of favors to do that, to just kind of, yeah. Man, what a fucking letdown. But hey, Oppenheimer, watch it. Watch Oppenheimer. I know I shit on it. I really did not make Oppenheimer sound very appealing. It's not really my fucking fault. Like, make the movie more exciting. Like, the movie should have been a 10 out of 10. So, you know what? I'll give Oppenheimer 7.5 out of 10. 7.5 out of 10. I will give The Killer a 2 out of 10. Yeah. So, there we go. All right. Time to move on uh, to, uh, you know the educational part of the show. Um, you know, take a little, uh, 
little bit of where that come from and a little bit of the old half-ass history to round out the day. And yeah, here we go. Time for a little break and then we'll do that. All right, one second. Here we go. We're going to do it right about now. All right, so time for a little bit of the old uh, where that come from. Take a famous, uh, you know, well-known everyday word or phrase, object, title, you know, something. Figure out the origins of it. Where does that come from? Why do we use it? Why do we say it? Why does it exist? All that good stuff. So for this one, we're going back to one of my favorite time periods to talk about just because of how absolutely batshit crazy things were. And we're going back to ancient Rome. So going way back to ancient Rome, there was a Roman commander named Claudius Crassus Sabinus. Or Sabinus. Uh, old Claudius Crassus is about to go into battle. He starts looking around, notices, uh, huh, a lot of people are not here. Who should be here? A lot of people uh, decided to desert his ass and not go into battle. Um, well, if you are a commander... For the military, that's not good. <laughs> um, definitely can't be letting that ever happen again. So, old Claudius says, time to teach the fellas a lesson. And make sure that nobody ever does this shit again. So, what Claudius does, very uh, ingenious little tactic. Claudius gathers up all of the soldiers. Starts finding the ones who don't have their weapons on them. Like, huh. Well, you must have been the ones who deserted me and did not go into battle with all the rest of the fellas. So he starts taking all, you know, separates the group with the weapons from the group without the weapons. So the group without the weapons, the deserters, separates them, puts them on one side, and has everybody look as he has each of those people without the weapons have them grouped into groups of ten. Out of that group of 10, he randomly picks one of them from each group of 10 and has them killed. Doesn't matter which one, no rhyme or reason for which out of the 10 he picks. He just basically made there be a 10% chance that you were going to die that day. Well, that works. It uh, terrifies the hell out of everyone. So by him doing that, he killed 10% of the people who had deserted him. Well, Latin for 10, deca, as in like decade, 10 years. The practice of doing this actually becomes... Uh, so doing this tactic actually starts happening more and more and uh, even kind of gets a name. So the practice of you know doing this, of killing one out of 10 people, uh, was called decimatio. English decimate so that is where the word decimate comes from killing 10 percent of a group of people yeah <laughs> boy ancient rome was wild all right time to move on to the old uh half-ass history all right so for the first story for today the hell oh man this is a a big what if in american history it involves a um a very infamous incident and one of the most important figures in American history and the near overlap that, uh, yeah, had things have gone just slightly differently. There is no telling where we would be right now. So to c tell the story, got to start with telling the story of the Donner party. So, the Donner Party was a group of about 89 people led by uh, Jacob and George Donner. Their plan was to head west from Illinois into California. Now, at one point, they're going to have to cross the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Uh, they decide to take a shortcut, which turned out to not really be a shortcut. Who would have thought? And, uh, you know, obviously they end up getting stranded, uh, snowed in. And things get real rough for the Donner Party. Eventually leading to some of the members eating the other members. Yeah, so I think that's a pretty famous story that most people know about the Donner Party. Now, 
a little bit of a sidebar of the Donner Party, a little side story that a lot of people don't know, is that one of the leaders of the Donner Party was a fellow named James Reed. Before they made it to the Sierra Nevada Mountains, where things would go very, very much downhill, before they make it to those uh to, before they make it to the Sierra Nevada mountains, James Reed is banished from the group. They're like, get the hell out of here. So James Reed ends up leaving. When he leaves, his wife stays. His wife ends up going across the mountains, is one of the people in the group when things, you know, go to shit. And when he leaves with her, he leaves all of his papers, everything behind. Now, most of the people do not survive. She does. She ends up getting rescued and makes her way to California. So what happens is people start looking through like these papers that were James Reed's papers who, you know, these papers were James Reed's. They're now hers. People start looking through them. And in those papers, they find a list of names in this list of names. These are so the list of names are people who James Reed fought alongside in the Black Hawk Wars a little bit before the uh, Donner Party, uh, the failed Donner Party happened. Um, In that list of names, it's, you know, like I said, people who fought alongside James Reed in the Black Hawk Wars. um, It's people who, the people he wrote down on the list are people who lived in the Springfield area, people that he knew personally. These were people who he personally asked to come along and join him with the Donner Party. Well, one of the people whose name was on that list, who he personally asked, a fella who almost said yes and almost went, may, if he would have went, may have even been cannibalized. Um, This young man chose not to go with him. The reason he chose not to go is because his wife was pregnant, didn't want to leave her behind. His wife was a young woman named Mary Todd. That man was future president Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. (laughs) Wild. So there's the story of how Abraham Lincoln uh, was almost eaten. Or just, you know, died. I mean, obviously he did later, but, you know, not before doing some pretty uh, important things. So, yeah, no telling what would have happened had he uh, said, yeah, screw it, I'll go to California for no reason. Um, All right. So time to move on to the next story. Here we go. All right. So for the next story, boy, (laughs) um, involves a pretty well-known actor, I would say, and how he almost, yeah, another, another what if that is quite mind boggling. So, the person that we're talking about is the actor James Woods, which, if you don't know who James Woods is, he was the voice of Hades and Hercules, he was in a Videodrome, Any Given Sunday, James Woods has been in a lot of movies, very accomplished actor. So, at one point, James Woods was on a flight uh, to Los Angeles. While he was on that flight, he looks over and sees four dudes acting Super suspicious. Uh, On this flight, they're not eating anything, drinking anything, sleeping. They're just staring straight ahead. James Woods is like, that's weird. Um, (laughs) Very suspicious. So he ends up telling the flight attendant. He's like, y'all might want to watch these dudes. This is weird. So he tells the flight attendant. Flight attendant ends up reporting it to the FAA. They do nothing about it. They're just like, all right, whatever. A report of suspicious behavior, it's probably nothing. Um, so we're not going to worry about it. Well, not the right move by the FAA. So one month later, on September 11th, 2001, four planes are hijacked. Two of those planes flown into the World Trade Center buildings. Two days after that, On September 13th, James Woods gets a visit from the FBI. The reason for that visit is that it turns out that four of the dudes who he had reported to that flight attendant were four of the hijackers. They were doing a test run, flying 
alongside James Woods, from Boston to Los Angeles. James Woods, the actor, nearly stopped 9-11. Or, well, at least, you know, played a... James Woods very well could have played a part in stopping, like, the largest terrorist attack of all time. James Woods legitimately reported it to the, to the, like, James Woods reported it to the flight attendant. She took it all the way to the FAA. They did nothing about it. So, it turns out that this was happening quite a bit. So, there were multiple test runs before that day, before 9-11. There were multiple test runs by the hijackers of, like, what they would do, how they would do it, kind of, I guess, figuring out what they were going to do that day. So, another one of those flights was Flight 77, which would later end up being the flight that went into the Pentagon. There was another test run on that flight, Flight 77. Uh, That flight was going from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. One of the people on that plane, on that test run, was the actor Rob Lowe. (laughs) Yeah, wild. So, James Woods, an American hero, I guess. Almost. Tried. I mean, incredible. So anyways, there's that story. One more, and then we will uh, wrap it up. All right, so the last one. Man, another overlap that you just kind of don't imagine happening, but it did. Um, I mean, it's like sad and like almost kind of funny at the same time. Not really that funny. More sad, but, you know, history's full of sad stuff. So, so this one we're going back to, uh, going back a long ways to 1998. May 14th, 1998. Legendary singer Frank Sinatra, hanging out at his house, has a massive heart attack. Uh, when he does, he ends up, you know, they end up bringing him an ambulance. Frank Sinatra gets into the ambulance still alive, gets taken to the hospital. Now, he is able to make it to the hospital in pretty much record time. The reason for that is because there's basically no one driving around. There is no traffic in the city. Uh, Very unusual. Well, the reason that there's nobody out and about is because also on that day, May 14th, 1998, Nearly 80 million people were at home glued to their televisions watching the series finale of one of the greatest sitcoms of all time, Seinfeld. So everybody's at home. Nobody's driving around. Ambulance is able to make its way to the hospital super fast. Not really fast enough, though. So back to the Seinfeld finale. One of the people who was at home watching that finale, uh, was Nancy Sinatra, the daughter of Frank Sinatra, who was supposed to go visit her father that day. She ended up not visiting him because she, according to her, got caught up watching the reruns of Seinfeld leading up to the finale. So she ends up not calling him, not visiting him, doesn't find out until after the finale's over that her father, Frank Sinatra, had passed away while she was watching the finale. Crazy. <laughs> I mean, what a God that has to I mean, you missed seeing your dad for the last time because you're watching what is arguably the biggest letdown in television history. But Yeah, so that'll do it for uh, this episode. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, You know, I'll be back uh, next week with some more, you know, hot takes and stuff. (laughs) Well, way to go out with a bang. All right, so until next week, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Goodbye.